So thank you very much and good morning. Um, for me, one of the most difficult thing over the years has always been that K uses thought in such a very broad and undifferentiated way, right? And that it's never clear what falls under this umbrella term of thought. At the same time, after his death, a completely, a completely new science, an academic discipline has risen and you know, come to full blossom, namely cognitive science, a discipline that just investigates the nature of cognition and thought. So I want to, in the next, I want to keep this under 25 minutes, not give a talk to you, and not argue for anything. I just want to do an information service uh, to you and tell you some uh, specific things that might be interesting in our discussion of thought. Um, from a cognitive science perspective, because there has been a lot of new insight and new data in a specific field. So yesterday, we've heard a lot about which components of the conscious self can be lost in isolation or dis dissociated. We've heard a, li a lot about the bodily self model and mechanisms of identification. And I just want to look at the cognitive self model, at that, en that entity that thinks it is a thinker of thoughts um, and this is improvised so this is actually a talk out of which I will cut out the second half and actually two-thirds so uh, just some information and <coughs> then we can um, discuss what if this is relevant to us so you've all heard the concept of mind wandering probably Scientists call this spontaneous task unrelated thought right now. That is just when you lose the present and there is a spontaneous task that has nothing to do with what you want to do right now. Say mindfully wash the dishes or something like that. So um, here are some examples of what mind wandering is and you will all recognize them. One is daydreaming, a spontaneous flow of imagery and fantasy. And these researchers speak about perceptually, perceptual decoupling. You dis uh, somehow you drift off, you dissociate from perceiving the current situation, and you go off into a fantasy. Unbidden memories. Memory retrieval, retrieval of episodes you lived through can be intentional, you search for a memory when the last time you've been in Ojai. But as we all know, this happens unintentionally all the time. You know, something comes to mind. And then she even said, can we not just be friends? You know, and you, you didn't want to remember that. But, you know, this kind of thing. Then there's something neurotic Germans like myself do all the time. Um, automatic planning is a large part. So you mentally simulate possible future actions or goal states. Uh, it's actually not necessary, but it happens automatically. Then there's something called autobiographical rumination, and that is, uh, Neil has talked about it, is mental time travel. So you think about yourself in the past or in the future of your life, but it is task unrelated. It has nothing to do with the problem you have to solve right now, like washing the dishes. And so you go back and forth in your own life narrative all the time. Another concept these researchers use is stimulus unrelated thought. So uh, with my jet lag having come back in the third night now, I have a lot of what they call attentional lapses, right? When you have these holes in attention and, and you just lose control over your attention and get more easily distracted or something falls off your mental conveyor belt that you just wanted to do. So self-generated thought chains just appear and they're independent of sensory perception. Um, this imp empirical research on mind wandering has had an enormous um, growth in the last years. 
So these two papers were seminal papers. The Restless Mind, this young man here, Jonathan Smallwood, is in my view one of the best young researchers really pushing the field forward. And a very interesting man is not very far from here, Jonathan Schooler at the University of Santa Barbara. They have cultivated and grounded this new field of um, mind-wandering research. That's another important paper from 2011. Uh, <coughs> in trends in cognitive sciences, and you see, you see all the topi topics. When do you have meta-awareness? Like Bohm would probably say proprioception of your own thinking. When is there decoupling from immediate moment perception, and when does the mind start to wander? So this is just for the scientists uh, <coughs> here. Here are two, the two best review papers recently, one from Psychology 2015 and one from Neuroscience. And if anybody has a scientific interest, I can point you to literature. Uh, a philosophical debate has also started. Philosophers are beginning to look at what the conceptual issues are in this flurry of recent research. So, um, <coughs> Let's start with a conceptual distinction, which will, you will all find quite um, intuitive. We can distinguish between human actions and behaviors. Actions are directed at a conscious image of a goal, and actions are something that you can terminate, suspend, or willfully inhibit. An action is something you can stop. But a behavior may be very well be purposeful from a third-person perspective, but, uh, perspective, but you have no conscious goal representation. Behaviors are rather automatic, and the self-control for behaviors is much lower than for actions. The conscious experience for actions is that there is a self that experiences itself as an agency. There is something Kay talked about quite a bit, which I think is very relevant to our topic, a sense of effort, a sense of being directed towards a goal, a sense of controlling myself as a whole, global self-control, and that it is my own action, that I own this. For behaviors, that's different. Some de behaviors have no conscious profile. They are completely unconscious. You know, like when in deep sleep you pull your linen, your bed sheets, or rearrange your body. Um, most deep behaviors are something where you would say, ah, this is my own behavior, but I'm not an agent in any interesting thing, th uh, sense. And the availability of the goal directedness varies. Sometimes you can look at it that this is actually goal directed, sometimes you're clueless. Behaviors have a lack of meta awareness. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, let us introduce this distinction for mental actions and mental behaviors. So what's a mental action? I'll give you two examples. Um, one example of a mental action is willfully controlling the focus of your own attention. Imagine you're sitting in Vipassana meditation, you realize you've had a thought, and you bring gently and precisely bring back attention to your breath. That period is a period of agency where a short, you know, the meditator appears. <laughs> Somebody who does something wants to go back to the breath. There's a sense of effort. Another example of mental action is mental calculation. Somebody asks you, what is 8 plus 3? And then you briefly add it up to 11. You mentally act with symbols. So the same thing. Mental actions are goal-directed. I want to know what 8 plus 3 is. I want to be the best meditator of all times. Um, they can be terminated, suspended, or inhibited. Oh, the phone is ringing. I stopped my mental calculation. Mental behaviors have no overt behavioral correlates. You can have mental behaviors while you just quietly sit in your chair but if you're, for instance, if you're depressive, you can have what they call depressive rumination, just constantly wander around in your sorrow and your negative thoughts. I've always been fat, you know, and I'll never, and so forth. 
Now there's a phenomenological profile with mental actions. It creates a mental self. The meditator, the calculator, the thinker of thoughts. There is a sense of mental effort, again something about which K spoke often, when he spo said things like, do you realize how much energy this costs? You know, I don't know if you remember these passages. You can mentally be directed at goals, you can control your own mind, and you can own your own thoughts, something you can lose in schizophrenia. Now mental behavior can also be completely unconscious. You're not even aware that you're on autopilot. You know, it just happens. I think a very interesting concept is the one of mental sleepwalking. And I think human beings can do a lot of mental sleepwalking. So you can own these neurotic automatic thoughts without feeling that you are the agent and you are, can be completely unaware of it, as we all know. So now the two most horrible slides and then uh, we come uh, to the more interesting stuff and we're done. As you know, I always try to offer a conceptual instrument that might be useful. That's what I take to be a philosopher's job to develop new conceptual tools that can help us look at something in a fresh way. So one concept is M autonomy, that's mental autonomy. The specific ability to control one's own mental functions like attention, episodic memory, planning, concept formation, rational deliberation or decision making in a goal-directed manner. So are you able to control your own thought or not? The important thing is that you have veto control. If you want to be mentally autonomous, you have to be able to stop your own mental processes, right? Somebody who would just fly around with his body on the floor and twitch and not be able to stop his own bodily movement. Of that person, we would say, it, there has, they have no behavioral autonomy on the bodily level. So the minimal requirement for something to be autonomous action is that you can actually stop it. It presupposes a capacity for intentional inhibition, which doesn't include rational thinking. And if you do that on the level of the mind, you get a very specific kind of self-model that is there, as I want to say, rarely, but it is there. And that is what I call an epistemic agent model. And I want to explain what that is in the second horrible slide. And then everything uh, will be okay. <laughs> so uh, what is an epistemic agent model? It is the experience of <coughs> being an actively knowing self. Sometimes, just like experiencing red or blue, we have this experiencing of being an Knowing self. self. It is a highly specific level in the human self model where you represent yourself as being an individual entity, a self, that has a certain capacity, namely controlling what it will know and what it will not know. For instance, the simplest instance of this is the capacity to control your attention. I will now look at those flowers in greater detail I will control what I know. I will not be distracted by Yap. I will not know anything about Yap. That is epistemic self-control. So it's a model of the self as standing in knowledge relations to parts of the world, as actively constructing such relations. I search for the flowers and I want to have a perfectly precise image of them and as possessing the ability to become an epistemic agent. So I might not be one, but as long as I still know I could concentrate, I could be mindful, I am one. Now the whole point that is really interesting for us, I'm getting ahead of myself for a little bit, is when you mind wander, say you're sitting in meditation, and boof, off you go in a train of unbidden memories, you do not have this ability anymore. And you don't know that you have the ability to go back to your breath. 
That is what, it may have to do with that Bohmian proprioception. That is what you lose in the moment um, <coughs> where you lose it and lose contact with the present moment. It's not only that you go somewhere else. It's that you lo lose the knowledge that you have this ability for as long as that mental episode runs. So I would say every mind-wandering episode begins with a collapse of that thing I call the epistemic agent model, the model of the knowing self. And then, boom, you know, the automatism runs. Theoretical intuition is having something like that is exactly what it means to have a first-person perspective in a rich and philosophically interesting sense. So this would mean that for large parts of our waking life, we don't actually have a first-person perspective because we're mind-wandering, we're on autopilot. We don't have a stable first-person perspective, but that's just an aside. So now the terrible slides are over and we're already approaching the end. If that is true, we can say that mind-wandering, getting lost in thought, is an unnoticed loss of epistemic agency. It's an unnoticed loss of determining <coughs> what you are on the level of mental content. And it's an unnoticed loss of mental autonomy. That is what being unaware is. And empirically, there are a lot of science. I won't bore you with this, but just cut this short. We know <coughs> what and the brain is responsible for it. There is something called the default mode network that is always chattering away, and there are some additional parts of the brain. But the important thing, I think, philosophically is, at least I think, mind wandering is not a property of the person as a whole. It is rather something like your heartbeat or your digestive movements. Mind wandering is not what you do, the person as a whole. It's a subpersonal event. Now, the next two slides are what I actually wanted to show you. <laughs> so here, you have a 24-hour cycle. And when are we conscious, according to science? If you just ask people, did you have an experience right now? So during 67%, we are awake. 11% of the time we have non-REM sleep, but if you awake people in a sleep laboratory, they still report something. During REM sleep, you have these wildly hallucinating dreams where you really see something with persons and situations. During non-REM sleep, you may, may rather have non-repetitive uh, repetitive thoughts, but not visual hallucinations. But if you awake people in non-REM and ask them, what did you just experience? They often give an answer. And then there's a period of our life, 16%, where there is strictly no conscious experience. Absolutely dreamless, deep sleep, right? Now, I have asked, and the next slide sums up f about 40 empirical papers on wine wandering that I have ra read. It sums up the research for you. And the question is, in that 24-hour cycle, how often are you in control of your own mind? How often do you have M autonomy and that you're really a mental agent? So it turns out during non-REM sleep, you always have never mental autonomy. During REM sleep, you can have a lucid dream and the appearance of lucidity in a dream is exactly that, the emergence of an epistemic agent model. You know that you can do something. In the unconscious period, obviously, you have no mental autonomy. And depending on the study, if you put buzzers on people's arms and you send them random signals, and whenever the buzzer on your arm goes off, you ask those people, were you on task or were you mind wandering? It turns, according to study, out that in 30 to 50% of your waking life, you are not in the present moment, up to half of it. And that is one major take-home message. This new research shows that we are all mind-wandering and of the present more often than we would think. 
You know, if you just ask people without a buzzer on their arm, they say, yeah, yeah, I was inattentive again. But if you really test it, the last moment before the buzzer of your, on your arm went off, what were you thinking about? You realize that during a large part of our waking life, we have no mental control. We are not in control of our own thoughts. Something is happening. Attention is somewhere. There's depressive rumination, neurotic planning. We are never washing the dishes. Right? So this is a conservative estimate because it is not clear when, for instance, in infancy, in early childhood, the capacity to control your own attention actually emerges for the first time. There may be a long period at the beginning of our lives where we are just basically drifting around in gaga. If you've looked at an infant and see how their visual attention goes around, you know, try to make them look at something, you know what I mean. But then there is also jet lag, <laughs> old age dementia, and cognitive decline. Age-related cognitive decline and mind wandering becomes more frequent in old age. You lose mental self-control. Um, by the way, there are many interesting detailed findings. For instance, I'll just give you two examples. Very small amounts of alcohol, half a glass of wine, already increase uh, the propensity, does one say, the, the, the tendency to mind wander quite strongly. Another thing is nicotine craving. As soon as you get into the craving thing for the next cigarette, mind wandering dramatically goes up. So we've learned a lot and nobody will be astonished. Academic success of students has a lot to do with how often they mind wander during reading. Then there's a new phenomenon that was just recently discovered. It's called mind blanking, and nobody remembers it, but you all have it. Sometimes you walk into a room, you don't mind wander, your mind's just blank. It's not exactly enlightenment, uh, <laughs> but uh, completely unaware, no content. The fact, one, it seems that scientists have overlooked this for such a long time because you don't remember that. Um, then there are people who suffer from seer insomnia during a fever, feverish dreams, coma, anesthesia, when you're drunk or stoned. Uh, there are periods in your life, other periods, where you lose mental self-control. So the more realistic estimation is that plausibly, for about two-thirds of our conscious lifetime, if you include dreams, we don't have mental self-control. This is just happening in us, thought unfolding without an agentive self for two-thirds of our conscious lifetime. That is basically the main thing I wanted to report to you. So mind wandering is an unintentional form of mental behavior. It's an involuntary form of mental activity. It's a loss of mental autonomy, and that's boring, complicated stuff. Uh, you cannot top down control it. So um, the interesting thing is that when you mind wander, you basically lose this capacity for veto control as long as it goes on. And then you remember oh, I wanted to be the greatest meditator of all times, and I'm actually a good human being, right? Uh, and then, boom, you remember the capacity. But before you remember the capacity, um, you have no possibility of interrupting this. It just unfolds, it hijacks you. Uh, it looks like this. And let me give you a, a person, something that really shocked me in one, of these papers by these psychologists. You know, we, yesterday we uh, talked about the illusion of control when I was using the clicker, but you were actually pushing the button. And I had the feeling I'm an agentive self. I'm, I'm clicking and the slides move. So one nasty sentence I, I read is that the interesting question is, of course, what is this moment of coming to? The moment of realizing, oh, and going back to your breath or the present moment, what is that moment? The experience is, 
I have just realized I was mind wandering, but I wanted to meditate. And now I am returning into the present moment. And this terrible cognitive scientist wrote, this may be an illusion of control. And I thought that was one thing I was very, that was very relevant also uh, to practices of very various sorts, that there may be an unconscious process leading to the remembering that you actually wanted to do something, be with the flowers in the present moment. Then it crosses the surface to conscious processing and is a complete surprise for the system. And then it constructs a model of, oh, I am the spiritual person that has just become aware again, and I do that. And that's a complete illusion of control. I will take no um, position on this. I don't know what the truth is scientifically, but that I think is also interesting in our um, context. So what I would say, but I will just briefly note this, that what we have thought, called conscious thought in the past, is actually a subpersonal process. And if you will, it is something that does not belong to any self. Just like as the peristaltics, the heartbeat or the breath in your body are not agentive in that sense that they belong to some mysterious self doing the breathing, right? But I won't go into all of this stuff. There are um, some papers on it. But briefly, this would be a standard uh, model of um, Vipassana meditation practice. So the idea is <coughs> there will be an episode of mind wandering, and this will be dominated by an area called the default mode network. Then there will be suddenly awareness of mind wandering, attention networks come online, then you shift attention, sustain the focus for a certain time, and then maybe you become aware of that sense of effort and let that go too. Maybe there is an unpersonal global state of observation, or not, right? And then out of the blue, that process of mind wandering starts again. Then suddenly, thought arises again. That is what some people who do neuroscience of meditation research, how they imagine the cycle of people trying to come back to the present moment. So I will end with a thought experiment that we can uh, maybe discuss. So imagine you are participating in a Buddhist style silent retreat, an intensive course in mindfulness meditation. I'll just read this to you. During the first three days, your teacher instructs you to very precisely observe your breath as it comes and goes, but without it any way interfering with the process itself. Your task is to, when you ever have noticed an incoming thought or any other sort of distraction, gently bring back your attention to the bodily sensations going along with the rise and fall of your chest or abdomen, and to the sensation of the breath at the nostrils and the internal flow of air. Whenever you notice you've had an attentional lapse, you simply return to your breath. But then later, on day four, as the retreat progresses, this teacher instructs you to become non-judgmentally aware of these incoming thoughts themselves as they come and go, not identifying or with them or reacting to them. So you have two things you do, right? Imagine you were doing this. We have two different tasks, and at least initially, two different kinds of mental action, leading to two different inner situations. Given these two situations, what exactly is it that you are phenomenally representing, consciously experiencing? What is your experience and experience of? I would say that in both cases, you are representing physical processes in the body. You are not experiencing actions, but events, chains of subpersonal events. The properties instantiated during these processes are not properties of the person as a whole. So when you experience breathing in meditation, this uh, is a representation of local bodily activity, right? 
This is not the body as a whole. But if you look at the relevant scientific data about mind wandering, the most parsimonious interpretation is that the thoughts uh, are also identical with the physiological process in the body, but one that you cannot perceive through any sensory system. Because the interesting thing that is often overlooked is the brain is blind to itself. The brain has no receptors by which it could in any way perceive its own activity. You cannot feel the brain, see the activity in the brain, hear it. There are no sensory receptors in the brain. So I would say in the case of mind wandering, if you are just with the flow of thought, what you're actually observing is a specific widely distributed pattern of neural activity and there's science on this they're finding out what that mind-wandering network is and so forth. I don't want to bore you about this. But there you actually observe the fluid dynamics in your brain, a part of it. It's a local bodily process. There's no agent there, no self there. That's what you observe and we call it the unfolding of thought or mind-wandering like this. You realize this is maybe a very materialistic, reductionist um, interpretation of what really happens, but you could argue for it with current science. And this means that in both cases, it's nothing selfie, what you're a poor. It has, in a certain sense, it has nothing to do with you as a whole. It is something that is happening in you, like your breath or your heartbeat. That's actually what I wanted to do you, to you as an information service. Just one last point, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. Let me see. Um, if that is true, there should be something I call a self-representational blink. Your eyes blink, you know that. Your lid goes down, up and down all the time. So in that moment, there's a brief moment of blink, a brief moment of blindness. There's also something that is scientifically very well researched that's called the attentional blink. If you're looking at the flowers and then you hear a sound at the window, your attention goes from there to there. It's just like the eyelid. Uh, over the eye of attention, there's a black moment in between. That's called the attentional blink. If I'm right, I'll leave all this stuff out there is a self-representational blink too. So say you're sitting on a red traffic light and you're trying to be in the present moment, so you identify with this body, the driver, and then suddenly a mind-wandering episode starts and says, oh, I still have to buy tofu and bananas. So there's this short video of you running through the grocery store and very short, maybe 300 milliseconds and looking in the shelves and picking it. Then you identify with that simulated self that runs through the shelves. There's another unit of identification. And there is, it's like a black slide in between. You first you identify yourself with the driver, then you go off into, oh, and oats too. And, and this guy said that yesterday and tomorrow I'm going to pay him back, right? And uh, so you have these units of identification and then suddenly the lights turn green and you are the driver again. So the unit of it identification is very unstable, actually. In dreams, it's very unstable. It jumps around all the time. In mind wandering, it's unstable. And if this is correct, and maybe some of you have explored this a lot in their lives, what we call this selfie process is actually highly discontinuous. I would claim that it breaks down every day many hundred times. You switch to another little, you know, protagonist in the story you are telling, that the system is telling. So if that is, that's an, I want to stop there. If that's an, the empirical hypothesis is right, we have a constantly, we have these shutters or black slides and we have blinks in the way that that conscious self emerges. And if that's right, it should be able, we should be able maybe th through observation to discover that. 
how discontinuous it actually is. And that there is just this cultural narrative that tells us that there is something there that is continuous. I think I should leave it at that. We should start running again. Okay. Yes, yes. Oh, we're discussing now. I thought I would get a break. <laughs> I have two questions, one is a short one. Uh, this talk that you gave uh, just now, would you call that a subpersonal process? That's very interesting, especially given jet lag. Uh, uh, um, the interesting question is, of course, if all of life is basically a selfless process, if one takes a closer look at it. But sometimes, um, during the talk, um, I, I had the feeling now I'm concentrating and now I'm going to the next slide and I'm doing this. I had the feeling I'm pushing this button, but I think it was intermittent. So on my, the level of my conscious experience, there was actually a strong intermittent experience that I'm giving a, a, a presentation to you. Uh, thanks for that. And the other question I have is whether this whole description you have given uh, is an average of several subjects who have been studied or it's true of every human being? No, uh, probably there's a wide variance. So I have just summed up many different empirical studies. Studies with um, students, for instance, a very easy thing to do is you all know this experience, you read a book and you realize you're not with the content anymore and you have to go up three sentences because this automatic scanning process ran on when you were <coughs> mind wandering. You can very nicely measure this with students. You can do eye tracking and see how often it happens to someone. So this is an, a standard paradigm. It's really interesting uh, uh, what that predicts. And I mean, a very simple, strong conclusion <coughs> is if is that we if we would introduce systematic mindfulness meditation in the educational system on all levels, academic success would just go would soar would go up. It would be very good for students if they did something like that. Um, so this are there are very different studies. What happens when you drink half a glass of wine? What uh, happens when you get older? So an interesting thing for those of, who, of, of us are getting older, a simple finding is distractibility by irrelevant information rises. You know, maybe you sometimes have phone calls from your mother and you realize this, uh, um, that very old people are able to do whole conversations by themselves. You know, <laughs> and uh, uh, they, they go off on side branches all the time. But recent research also shows that old people are valuable to the community as a whole um, because by being distractible, they sometimes discover something really important all the rest of us doesn't see. Uh, and uh, so in, in, in group interaction, there's a, a trade-off there. But so, and the question is of course, could there be a human being that, so to speak, has full mental autonomy or a mind that never wanders? Or another interesting distinction is, and that's actually interesting for us, is between, I've learned from these researchers, of zoning out and tuning out. So imagine you're sitting in a boring lecture. Zoning out means just boom, you go and think of your le uh, next holiday and you lose it completely. But tuning out is something that most of us do much more often in everyday life. So we pursue an interesting little sexual fantasy for a little bit and we nudge it a little bit and then let it unfold by itself, but we keep a foot in the lecture. <laughs> and after uh, five minutes we say, oh, this guy isn't getting any better. It's still boring. So, um, you know, we trigger that little fantasy a little more, let it unfold, maybe 
that direction, enjoy ourselves in an inner story, but then tune back and say, oh, this lecture, this guy, this will never get good, you know. Um, so we often we mind wander also for emotional autoregulation in boring situations when we don't like life to distract ourselves. So if one looks at it more closely, it's not either being fully in the present or being completely lost, but is there are all kinds of nuances in between. Um, recently, a scientist called Paul Seeley in America found that many mind-wandering episodes, up to 42%, are actually started intentionally. So you begin to mind-wander because you want to daydream a little and distract yourself from something that is boring, uh, but then you lose it. <laughs> you know, then you get completely involved in your inner movie. So there's a very fine interplay between actually wanting this yourself, wanting yeah, to be unaware, I'm going to try to sort of turn <coughs> the image upside down um, okay. and trying to make sense of it, because suddenly I thought that perhaps what you've been discussing is mind wandering. We mm -hmm. could think of that as the movement or the process of memory or consciousness. Hesitantly, I put that word in because that's how some people use the word. So this would be the movement of memory. And it's a process like all other processes in the body. And I'm not aware of what my metabolism is doing now the process of the heartbeat all. So there are these processes going on. And what if the movement of memory is one of such processes? And then what I think you call the, um, I want to get this right, so M autonomy, the mental agent. Is that really the appearance of the center in the sense that Krishnamurti would use that word? And no. Just, let me just add this one thing to you, because one of the things that comes up is this question of, is there a thinker who produces the thought? Mm -hmm. Or is there the movement of thought in which the thinker appears? Well, I think, to c start with the last question, and you remind me of <laughs> the ones before, is that the process of thought may be something like this, these dolphins, dolphins porpoising, that is sometimes unconscious and sometimes conscious. And this movement of thought sometimes generates a thinker when the dolphin jumps out of the surface into consciousness, and you have to understand, why did I have this sudden thought? Why did this appear in my conscious mind? And the best hypothesis may be, well, since this appears in me in some sense, I must be the cause of it. I thought that thought. I did it. So I don't fully understand this, but maybe this emergence of a sense of control. I did this. I'm thinking it is a way in which the whole system tries to somehow explain to itself what is actually going on here. Uh, you know, it could be like that. What were you asking just before? <laughs> uh, the, no, no, just before that, yeah. Because my sense was from what you were saying, and I might be misunderstanding, yeah. is that there is this sense of agency directedness, you know, I'm going to attend to this, attending to that. And then you were describing this phenomenon whereby that goes mm -hmm. in an unnoticed fashion. And then whatever goes on is unnoticed, essentially. And I, so there's this sense of that's where the mind wanders. So it's as if you're going from one state into another state, and, and what really happens there. That versus the idea that the wandering is happening all the time. The sort of, if you like, our memories are not just static, but they're constantly of moving course. this and that. And under certain circumstances, out of that would arise this sense of I am attending or I am willing this yes. thought or I'm directing my attention, and then it simply goes away. Yes. The movement is happening underneath all the time, and out of that arises this, um, I think, M autonomy that you call, and then it goes away, and it arises, goes away. Yeah. Right? That's I think w that's one way to imagine it. There are people like I think psychoanalysts talked of something like the primary process that is unfolding all the time. So you basically, this is chattering, chattering away all the time. But sometimes the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex latches onto it and starts to ride the wave a little and to control this and turn this into a logical thought or in controlled episodic memory retrieval or calculate something and then it lets go again and it, then it unfolds as it always does and does whatever it does. So 
sometimes maybe it could be described that we try to write it and somehow control it. And as soon as that doesn't work, it again unfolds by itself. That could be uh, one way to look at it. But a second thing, it looks to me, imagine you're sitting in this beautiful garden out of here, uh, outside by yourself. And you're impressed about all these things you've heard about Krishnamurti again. And then there's something pops up in your mind. The idea of, of observing without an observer, right? It pops up in your mind. Then you want to do that. Yeah, I've got a serious problem. <laughs> uh, and um, this, uh, if you try to move to a non-centered awareness that is effortless of the moment as a whole, you actually don't only have the problem of letting that little th last thought go and try to return to some state of open monitoring or something like that, but you have um, two um, pro further problems that most people overlook. The first one is a certain emotional state. You're so disappointed with yourself that you strayed from the present moment again. You know, there's a certain emotional reaction to it. Oh, I've had a thought again. I'm not. I am not as I want to be. An obs ob pure observation without an observation observer. So you have to let that emotional reaction go. And the other thing is, if you do anything, like trying to return your attention to the present moment, there's a sense of effort going along with it. And one of the most important things I learned from Kay, it was for me was important, was that he told me everything that creates a sense of effort is wrong. Um, that was very important instruction from me. So you, you have two problems. You have to lead, let the effective reaction go somehow, the disappointment with yourself, the crazy thought you had, you know, this intellectual thought about observation without an observer. You have to let that go. And the sense of effort. It's, it's tricky. You know, I don't know what, maybe you, your experience is different. Uh, yes? Yeah. Hi, Thomas. Uh, I just wanted, wanted to ask, based on the research that you know about, uh, this sense of agency, uh, you, you were mentioning uh, losing mental self-control. You mentioned some example, uh, jet, jet lag or <laughs> yes. due to age. So that, that implies that at sometimes there is self-control, that actually this sense of agency, this agent is able to uh, make conscious decisions, or it's just a narrative, almost like an epiphenomenon, I think it's called, when you actually have a narrative and the decision has been already made unconsciously, and you just, it's the only just that sense. And the, the last thing is, which it kind of connects with free will, I guess, which is this research yes. that people, they, uh, I think they ask them if to choose between two colors, and but then they can actually detect that the choice has been done before they mm -hmm. actually consciously yes. say. Okay. The, that's the that I want. Yeah, that's a very good question, and it's a very difficult question. In the last paper I wrote, it's called The Problem of Mental Action. It's open access. You find it on my webpage if you want to get complicated about this. I write a lot about it, but the open, what is open for decision, I think, as well as from philosophy as from neuroscience, is if I am right and there is something like an epistemic o agent model sometimes, sometimes we have the experience of being an actively knowing self. Then there are two interpretations. One of them is that is itself causally efficient. It has a causal force, that model. The other thing is that's just a post hoc confabulation of something that has already unconsciously happened in the brain. It's just a surf surface level narrative and the, the whole experience of, uh, oh, I, yeah, I have successfully returned into the present moment is an illusion. <laughs> Am I permitted to say? <laughs> I'm not permitted to say an illusion without a self behind it, right? So that's a deep question. I have no official position on it. But it's, if I may give, make them one footnote, this shows something 
and I have no, I don't know what to say about it, but that the most ruthless, reductionistic, neuroscientific perspective on these things, which would say, yeah, that, even that's an illusion of control. That's just a high-level narrative. That, that thing we don't want to be true and that we are suspicious of might actually have extremely great significance for case teaching or spiritual practice or something like that. A, nobody wants this to be true, <laughs> you know, that this is actually all of it an illusion of control and just a model in the brain. But if this, so to speak, the very nasty neuroscientific story in the end should turn out to be true, it has direct relevance to the things, you know, we are all thinking about. Yeah, I was just thinking uh, from what you said about the heartbeat. Yes. That uh, it's, a, it's just a biological thing, and there's no agency and control of that. Uh, and the movement of memory, it sounds like it's a brain beat, something similar. The mm -hmm. brain is just beating or doing its wandering. Mm -hmm. So it would be absurd to say, I am beating my heart. But it's not absurd to say, I'm thinking a thought. But it seems that it should be equally absurd. If you, if you look at it in the way that you're describing, b but we don't. We say, somehow in our communication and our language and how we've learned, it's okay to say I'm thinking a thought. That sounds like a meaningful statement. Mm -hmm. But, so the absurdity of it is that, I mean, how internalized does that have to be in order to, say, affect how we observe what is actually happening? Because as long as I keep thinking that there's an agent that comes back and then the mind wanders and I accept all that, but I'm not seeing that it's all just one movement. Whether it's I feel an agent or whether the mind is wandering, it's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. So is it the absurdity of it that has to, be, has to come clear to our attention in order to change any of this? Because it almost sounds like you can't change any of this because it's just going to happen. We're just going to flip from one to the other to the other, and that is our experience. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I was just thinking about that. If it's a, uh, uh, it has to, this sense of agency has to feel as absurd as saying, I am beating my heart. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it, there's no real understanding of all this. Yes, I understand very well what, all of what you're saying, but I have simplified things a little bit. Um, first of all, I think, I don't know if it's right, so I think 8% of the population also are able to consciously experience their heartbeat. For the rest of them, it's almost unconscious. And we can control our heartbeat. Yogis. Well, you can do something. Yeah, there is some level, some level of autonomy by which systems like ourselves can control their heartbeat. So maybe we have already the system as a whole, but maybe selflessly can also learn to control this autonomous flow of thought in itself sometimes. And the way it explains to itself that it currently has this higher level of autonomy or self-control is this agency story. That's where the self emerges. Maybe that's the, so to speak, the brain's shorthand for explaining to itself what is actually going on. Could be one story, but uh, this absurdity, uh, you know, many people we have, uh, I don't know how I'm gonna say this, it causes enormous anxiety reaction, what you've just said, in many people. Because many normal people who don't think about these matters think, if anything along these lines is true with freedom of the will and, and th there's an absurdity in there, this is very dangerous to my mental health. I don't know, maybe you also feel this in yourself, that, that there's an immediate reaction of don't go there, you know. Um, don't play with fire. What is going to come out on the other side of it? Uh, so. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on this. I understand very well of seeing the absurdity, but um, are there good reasons for the anxiety reaction we have? 
Um, I don't know. Yes. Just to try to sharpen up a little bit about the thinker and the thought, Krishnamurti maintained that it is not the case that the thinker thinks the thoughts, but in fact, thought creates the exactly. thinker. Uh, I'm just wondering if cognitive science concurs or confirms that insight or whether it has anything to say about it. That's exactly why I gave this little information service to you, because I think it's very close to doing exactly that. Of course, these people, I mean, Jonathan Schooler of Santa Barbara, he has come to Switzerland with my PhD students, and we did three days of a silent retreat in a, in a Buddhist secular center and three days of science. They do uh, mindfulness meditation. They are very much aware of it. They know that statistically speaking, there's a paper of it. Mind wandering is exactly the opposite theoretical construct, construct of mindfulness. They know that very well. They use uh, meditators as subjects in uh, scientific studies. But I think all of this comes out of it, exactly what you're asking. It might confirm K in a way. I think the, how do you say in English, the verdict isn't yet out. But it might be that this creation of the thinker is the best way the brain can explain what is currently going on in itself, to itself. So it's another thought, which would mean that we are not thinking, but are being thought. And um, I'm always thinking, you're already showing up uh, about Bohm and proprioception. OK. <laughs> uh. Oh, I sorry. I didn't. You are the agent. <laughs> I think this is very interesting, this mind wandering that is considered totally negative. And in this culture, in any culture, it, it is looked as something we should do away with. But I really think in perceptual formation of consciousness, uh, consciousness tries to be very strict and very intact. Mm -hmm. And when that is formed, we realize that we are in prison, that we are totally uh, isolated, we are totally in a focus, keyhole vision of, of the world. I think consciousness in itself, and to me this is kind of like almost like a part of the material process because consciousness is subtle material process. There are two forces that are operating, seems to me. One is the identity that tries to keep the boundary and the keyhole uh, intact. And another one is entropy that tries to break it. So I really think, I always thought the mind wandering is... Uh, a uh, very, uh, very important factor where mind wandering start to get out of the prison. Mm -hmm. But it's still kind of neither one is good. Both of them are still in between kind of a thing. Mind wandering is kind of a still being lost in a certain weird way because there is a this tendency. If I'm mind wandering, I want to go back to the intact self. If I'm in a self, I'm isolated, lonely, and I want to go back into mind wandering. I remember just as a one reference to Krishnamurti's talk on education, where kids would uh, have this mind wandering because they got bored with the, with the teacher, and they would look through the window. And Krishnamurti, in, in the letters to the school, uh, was uh, suggesting don't uh, don't try to bring them back from mind wandering. Mind wandering is a very important factor. But uh, the big, bigger thing here is to me, and I think I would like you to respond to that, that maybe mind wandering is the uh, beginning of um, decomposi decomposition of our prison of consciousness and trying to get somewhere else uh, trying to have a draft of kind of something vast that we kind of uh, by coercing that vast by forming a thought that we kind of lost. Mm -hmm. So is the, is the young man who spoke of optimal grip and Merleau Ponty here? No, he was here yesterday. So um, 
first some anecdotal evidence. When I talk to mind-wandering <laughs> researchers, they hate these spiritual people. And the biggest problem they have is overcoming this intuition that everybody has that mind-wandering is bad. And uh, they try to find reasons of why it evolved and functions for which being completely unaware and daydream are good. I'll tell you two for which there is scientific evidence. One thing is creative incubation. Uh, if you are looking for a solution to a problem or something, daydreaming is good for that, for finding a novel creative so uh, solution. Uh, and you all know the effect um, that you go to bed with an unsolved problem at night and the first thought that pops up in the morning presents you uh, the answer on a silver platter. So there may also be a deep relationship between daytime mind wandering and nocturnal dreaming. And uh, this relates to the second thing. Um, a hypothesis on the table is, is that mind wandering helps with the consolidation of long-term memory. Like rehearsing past events, for instance, is actually a process of restructuring memory in the brain and laying things down. And that is also a candidate for the function of nocturnal dreaming, right? Uh, so it has evolved for a purpose, and people are thinking what is actually good about mind wandering. I have this vague idea about cognitive affordances. Who has heard the concept of an affordance? There's this uh, psychologist, Gibson. He said, what we perceive is never a chair, but an affordance for action. What we actually see, if we look closely at our conscious experience, is this is something I could sit on. This is not only a cup. This is something I could put to my mouth and drink out of it. So what we, the world around us are actually possible actions, affordances for action. And one idea is that mind wandering set up, sets up an inner affordance landscape. So all these little thoughts, you're sitting on your meditation retreat and there's this endless chain of thoughts. And all these thoughts say, um, think me. You know, imagine children raising their arms because they want to be picked up. And there's this infinite chain of children who said, pursue me further. This is interesting content. Uh, develop me, latch onto me, take my hand, go my path. Think me, I'm the last of my kind. I will never come again. You know, it's always, it's almost like every of these reduct, uh, um, arising thought has a certain seductive force that says, think me. You know, identify and get lost with me somehow. And maybe the function of the mind wandering network is to constantly set up a landscape, an inner landscape of affordances for inner action, of things you could think about, things you could feel, things you could dream and fantasize about. This may have been helpful in biological evolution, but he nods, but it may also have created a lot of suffering. And it's maybe the last point I should note. There's solid uh, uh, evidence, empirical evidence, that the frequency of mind wandering diminishes the quality of life uh, satisfaction. A wandering mind is an unhappy mind, and you can uh, measure that. No, I have uh, one question from, the, uh, oh, from yeah. the stream, from the people who are streaming, and then Patik wants to have one question, and then we're, uh, I mean, is Pete still with his question? Or is that over? The short ones don't exist. But uh, uh, Patik, Rabindra, Pete. And then we are. Oh my God. And oh and then you. Okay, good. <laughs> so three people. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do first. Yeah, yeah. Let's see how. So the streaming question from Teyaswini Rajwade Is there any mental fitness exercise science, science has found? to delay, help, age-related deterioration of a mental health? Um, I don't really know. I'm a philosopher. I'm not an expert on this. Um, 
but uh, there's evidence that good physical exercise, for instance, perception of natural environments while you're exercising your body helps uh, uh, to keep up many functions. You may also want to check nutrition. There are some, time, some things you need more as you get older, um, but I'm no expert on this. I really cannot say something relevant for me. You get these time slots, you're allowed to give them away, so I give mine to her. So she yeah, but Deborah Bain No. no. Oh, she, oh, 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 okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. What? They ain't control. Well, I ain't. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> so, my question, I'm trying to phrase it the right way because all of these terms are extremely new to me. Um, I have a question just relating to the subconscious and what role you think it might play in mind wandering. I guess like my gut feeling is that the subconscious would be more like the EAM, I think that's the term you use. No, like that's a conscious thing by definition. That's oh, okay. the conscious model. So okay, yeah. sure, thanks for clarifying. E but like my gut feeling is that the subconscious is actually in control and when it causes your mind to wander, it, there could be a purpose if we don't recognize that purpose, then the wandering kind of continues. Yes. Versus being able to complete the task and then come back to present. That's right. So a lot of uh, thought may actually be unconscious thought, which means that we really don't know what is going on. And uh, one idea we also, I think, have to say goodbye to is that at any given moment, there is one and only one task so this weird conscious self may have the task of mindfully washing dishes. But the organism as such has a million of tasks. It is constantly, you know, weighing at each other and thinks it, it has to do, it has to finally fall in love and find, you know, a good partner and there's a problem with the bank account. So there will be a lot of unconscious goal representations in us that's a plausible view, that constantly compete for becoming conscious. There will be something like a competitive process in the brain for what may hook on to motor control and force the poor animal to act it out, or what may hook on to the attentional focus and force, force you to attend to it. So one, I think, very plausible view of how mind wandering starts is, how did I call that? Um, externally cued unconscious goal representations. So you walk through your conscious world and they're completely unknown to you, that conscious self. There is an unconscious goal. I wanted to bring one flower uh, to my mother and I forgot to buy flowers. And then the conscious perception of these flowers activates this goal represent, or it's already active, but brings it into the conscious mind. And then you lose contact to the now and say, ah, could I steal one of these flowers without anybody realizing? Would solve a problem. So the idea is that you go through the world and you have a lot of unconscious goal representations and the environment may trigger them in you. And then you get distracted then you have an attentional lapse. Uh, I think that's uh, one plausible story. And the only solution to this is uh, to have no goals, right? No, but think of a creature that had no goals whatsoever, neither consciously nor unconsciously, because it had renounced the world. That creature could walk through this landscape of affordances without having attentional lapses, but just a footnote. I was just wondering if there's um, any measurement of, I, I was just thinking that the brain, the way it's described, it's working all the time. So how does it get rest? And if this mind wandering, if uh, different parts of the brain are involved, if the mind wanders and one part of the brain is active, it means that another part of the brain goes, may go inactive. Is that a way of a natural way of creating a kind of rest or, or to make it work efficiently it needs to be able to do this because mm. it seems that if one part of the brain is moving all the time it might get worn out or something 
like how the eyes work or the retina or something like that where different chemicals are being depleted by colors and then re replenished and repleted so you can see. Well, unfortunately, I cannot, the facts don't come to mind, the, the proper numbers. But this default mode network, that continuously active network uh, in, uh, in, re in resting states was discovered by an excellent American scientist, Markus Reichler, uh, in 2001. And the big question is, why is there such a large part of the brain that c consumes so much energy? I don't know the numbers, but I think it's like, no, it's, it's a large part of the metabolism. I don't want to say anything false. You burn a lot of sugar with this baseline activity, this default mode network, and nobody knows what the function of this is, you know? It's getting better now, but that was the original question when I discovered this. How can there be such a large part of the brain? The answer to the um, other question is the brain is always terribly active. Even if we have the subjective feeling of being in a calm and rested state, if one were to measure the energy level or the metabolic price, how much sugar you have to burn for it, it might be the same for a state that is subjectively experienced as clarity and rest. So it's probably just another way of functioning, another way the information flows. Dreaming, sleeping, high energy state in the brain, you know, it's, it's incessantly active. Um, and that's, for many of us normal people, it's counterintuitive. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, consciousness is this little icing on the cake. Uh, it has to do the real job of keep, keeping the organism uh, alive. It also has to do when it is sleeping. Uh, it has to be able to rouse the animal very fast if there's a danger. So it has to keep some feelers out when to switch consciousness on again. It's also a job unconsciously mo monitoring the environment while you sleep, you know. Okay, thank you, Thomas. And thank uh, you. We're having a break now, and after the break, there will be, uh, all the speakers will be speaking in a panel. Okay. <laughs>